This is part two of the video that talks about the inverse Laplace transform at a conceptual level and introduces the concepts you need to perform inverse Laplace transforms. In part one of this video, we introduced the idea that we can take the inverse Laplace transform of a ratio of two polynomials. So in this case, we have a ratio of one in the numerator and this polynomial in the denominator. And we can break this uh, ratio of polynomials into separate individual terms. The number of terms we have will correspond to the number of roots or poles in the denominator polynomial. And we can represent these by a plot that shows the complex plane, real and imaginary parts of our complex numbers, and we put an x wherever we have uh, a root of the denominator. For every value of s where the denominator is 0, we put an x. And then each of these poles corresponds to a particular term in our partial fraction expansion. So the partial fraction expansion looks like this. So the thing that we have not talked about and will not talk about in this video but we'll talk about in subsequent videos is how to compute these constants because that's the magic here. Once I know the constants then I can take the inverse Laplace transform using a table and everything is great. But again, we won't talk about how to do that in this video. In this video, we'll talk about how to, or, or we'll talk about the fact that there is some structure because uh, the two poles that have imaginary parts, you'll notice, are complex conjugates of each other. So the imaginary part of each of these poles is a negative of the imaginary part of the other pole. So this is it j, this is at minus j. It turns out that k2 and k3 are also complex conjugates. And the fact that k2 and k3 are complex conjugates allows us to go through some mathematical manipulations, which I won't do here. Um, if there's enough interest, uh, I might put together a separate video on actually doing those computations. But after you do the computations, you get the following result. To make this make sense, we first need to define the real part of uh, this term down here as alpha. And the magnitude of the imaginary part as omega. So in this case, alpha is equal to 2 and omega is equal to 1, okay, because the imaginary part has a magnitude of 1. And with those definitions and some mathematical manipulation, you can take this whole, this chunk of two terms, and you can write it in the following form. You can write it as a s plus alpha over s plus alpha squared plus omega squared plus b omega over the same thing. Wow, this color hurts my eyes. In this expression, a and b are constants their values are actually related to k2 and k3. So there are constants that still need to be computed in the partial fraction expansion. But you might ask the question, why would I want to do something like this? Um, I've taken two fairly simple things here and converted them into two fairly much more complicated things here. Well, the reason for this is the following. If we look at our Laplace transform table again, you'll notice 
fact, we'll move it mostly out of the way. You'll notice down here at the bottom that I have something that looks like s plus alpha over s plus alpha squared plus omega squared. And strangely enough, that's what I have down here. I also have something that looks like this, which I also have down here. So these two terms, the k1 and k3, or k2 and k3 terms, have been algebraically manipulated to give us something that the inverse transform of is easy to get from the table. The inverse transform of this is given by the e to the minus alpha t sine omega, or cosine omega t, it's given by this one. The inverse transform of this is given by this one. So I can actually now just write down what the time functions are that correspond to these two terms. It would be a e to the minus 2t, because alpha is equal to 2, cosine t, u of t, just run out of space, plus b e to the minus 2t sine t, or uh, yeah, actually omega here is 1, so it's just sine t. And those are both times u of t. So basically what we've been able to do is do some manipulation to get this into the form where we can now use the table to do the inverse Laplace transform. Now it turns out there's only two possible kinds of roots. There's real roots, which we know how to handle. Uh, in fact, we'll bring our transform table back up again. There's real roots that we know how to handle because they look like this if the root is 0, or they look like this if the root is non-zero. And there's complex roots, and we found that the complex roots we can turn into something that looks like a sine and a cosine. You'll recall from your algebra that that is the only two possible kinds of roots you can get from a polynomial. They'll either be real or they'll be complex. So we now have the machinery we need to be able to take the inverse Laplace transform of any ratio of two polynomials. Well, there's actually quite a few things that we haven't talked about yet, but we will. Um, the only thing that we really need to be able to do now, the one thing that's keeping us from being completely happy here, is figuring out how to compute these constants, or equivalently, the a and b down here. And that will be the subject of another video. Before I finish this video, there's a few things I would like to point out. One is that uh, conceptually, now hopefully you understand how this works. Uh, the denominator polynomial determines what the roots are. The roots determine what kinds of terms you're going to have in the partial fraction expansion. And those terms determine what your time values are going to look like. There are other ways to do this. It turns out that if you have access to the internet, you can go to Wolfram Alpha, and it will actually compute the inverse Laplace transform of something uh, directly. So you go to Wolfram Alpha, you type inverse Laplace of something like 1 over s cubed plus 4 s squared plus 5s. This would all be on one line. And Wolfram Alpha will actually compute the inverse Laplace transform of this whole thing without you doing anything else. Now, it turns out that Wolfram Alpha will probably put it in a format that's not as useful as some of the other formats you could get. Quite often, it doesn't give you a nice uh, e to the minus 2t cosine and an e to the minus 2t sine. But that's one option. Other symbolic mathematical systems like Maple, etc., will also compute the inverse Laplace transform directly. Computing partial fraction expansions, uh, it turns out that Wolfram Alpha 
we'll compute a partial fraction expansion directly instead of telling it to do the inverse Laplace transform you just tell it to do a partial fraction and give it the same value you have here and it will compute the partial fraction expansion uh, numerical computation packages such as MATLAB will also uh, compute the coefficients in the partial fraction expansion. Many calculators today will compute coefficients in the partial fraction expansion. So if you have these sorts of computational resources available to you, and if you're in a situation where you're allowed to use them, it probably makes sense to do that because uh, computing partial fraction expansions by hand can be tedious and prone to error. I spent a lot of time as an undergraduate uh, feeling like it was tedious and being frustrated because I made so many errors. If you are required to do the partial fraction expansion by hand, then um, I feel sort of sorry for you, uh, but also uh, I will produce uh, some subsequent videos that talk about how to compute partial fraction expansions by hand. So. This concludes this video. Hopefully at this point you have a clearer understanding of how inverse Laplace transforms are computed.